This is Sonia from An Enthusiastic Reader, and I'm here today to do a review of the novel Asymmetry by Lisa Halliday. This book was recently named one of Publishers Weekly Best 10 Books of 2018, and I had was reading it right when that pronouncement came down, and I haven't heard really anyone on BookTube talk about this novel, so I thought I'd give my thoughts on it. But I don't think I can talk about the structure of this book and how that structure affects its meaning without spoiling some of the plot. So if you're planning on reading Asymmetry, turn off the video, maybe bookmark it and come back to it if you choose to or if you'd like to. But I'd like to talk about my impression of what the meaning of this novel is and I can't do that without spoiling some of it. So. I think there's a lot here to mine and a lot here to admire about this novel. It blew me away um, and it also made me feel incredibly sad and despairing, so keep that in mind too. But it's a great story about a romance and about war and about reconciling our relationships and our desires to create art. The book has kind of an unusual structure. It's in three parts. The first part is called Folly. The second part is called Madness. And the third is a coda. In the first part, Folly, we have the story of an unlikely romance between a young woman, she's about 27 years old, named Alice, and a world famous author who happens to be probably in his 70s or 80s when they meet and get together. Um, her name is Alice and his name is Ezra and apparently he's supposed to be kind of modeled after Philip Roth. And the author of this novel, Lisa Halliday, did have a relationship with Philip Roth so she took a kernel of what must have happened between them and then crafted fiction out of that story. Um, I have no idea what their relationship was like and I don't know how much, if any, of the real relationship filters down into the novel itself. I have no idea. But I'm ignoring that. I didn't know that when I read the book and it did not affect me. I kept thinking John Updike or trying to think of what type of older, rich, highly successful novelist would be the model for this book, and it turned out to be Roth. So anyway, they get together. The character Ezra is extremely controlling over the relationship, uh, when she can come, when she must go, what happens when they're together, and it doesn't seem at all that Alice herself feels coerced in any way. She seems to enjoy her time. With Ezra, she is an assistant at a publishing house, so she knows writers and publishers and editors and knows of his reputation. And they have this agreement that she won't talk about their relationship. It's not a public relationship, but she is there for him when he needs her. And he's also incredibly generous with his time and with money if she needs an air conditioning unit put in, or she needs a new winter coat, or anything that she might need, he is willing to give her. So it's not as though it's a relationship where he is soliciting her uh, attentions for money, but he is also willing to give back to her. And they are on an even keel for the most part, but she feels a yearning to create and she's always thinking about should she be a writer should she try writing should she break away from you know being an assistant editor and try something else and as Ezra gets older and more uh, dependent on her because he has many medical problems she's feeling a pull to break away from the relationship and he ends up begging her, please don't leave, I need you. And at that interlude, we reach the second part of the novel, which is called Madness. And I know that this has thrown a lot of people off because you start reading the second section and it has absolutely nothing to do with Alice and nothing to do with Ezra. It has to do with 
uh, a man, an Iraqi American named Amar, whose brother has returned to Iraq. And this is all during the time of the Iraqi war. And he disappeared, the brother disappears. So most of the current contemporary part of this section of the book is Amar being detained at the airport, uh, being questioned by the authorities in Britain and tied to his brother's peril in the Iraqi war. So, so there's that terror of being imprisoned or being totally without, of your, without your own control of your life and your destiny at the hands of a government that is very suspicious of you because of your nationality. Uh, it's a really powerful section of the book and it there are some quotes that i highlighted about during this section about amar when he goes to iraq to visit his brother before his brother is um, abducted he has to kind of give up some of his american views of time and of patience and of expectation of what's going to happen and just let fate occur because the, their society is broken down because of the Iraqi war. His brother said, maybe I was feeling my solitude too keenly. Maybe I thought that by writing things down, inking out a record of my existence, I was counteracting my disappearance, my erasure. You know what they say, make your mark on the world, but I'm telling you, little brother, this notebook is a very sorry mark. So it's almost as though the brother intuited that something was going to happen to him and that he felt like he was being erased from the culture even before he was abducted. This was another quote that I thought was kind of chilling. You come to see a mostly peaceful and democratic society as being in a state of incredibly delicate suspension. Suspension that requires equilibrium down to the smallest molecule such that even the tiniest jolt, just one person neglecting its fragility with her complacency or self-absorption could cause the whole fucking thing to collapse. Or Ezra is being interviewed by a public radio program asking you what albums you would take if you were stranded on a desert island. Um, apparently this is based on a real thing. I am not aware of this. Unless maybe something in the BBC. I haven't heard of it, but anyway. That's neither here nor there. Ezra is imparting his wisdom to this interviewer about his life and why he would choose certain albums to take on a desert island. And, you know, it shows his wealth, his privilege, his um, lack of... Uh, his capacity to love only within the, his capacity, meaning he, he isn't capable of seeing beyond his own needs and beyond his own wants. Um, in his loving relationships and and it's in this coda that it became clear to me that the second section the madness section is really Alice's creation it's not being written by the logic of the novel wherein a narrator is telling Alice's story and then the same narrator is telling a Mars story I think it's pretty clear from the text that Alice has written the second section. Um, and then I went back and reread the whole first section again after I'd finished the book. And there's Amar as she's on jury duty and there's the character and that's where you can see that she's been inspired to tell a story of um, a Muslim man and does she have the right or the ability to capture the consciousness of a person that's so unlike herself she struggles with that, um, finding the courage to look within herself and tell a story that is outside her own experience. And Ezra in the final coda of the book reveals that someone unnamed has written a little novel. A young friend of mine has written a rather surprising little novel about this in its way about the extent to which we're able to penetrate the looking glass and imagine a life that goes some way to reduce the blind spots in our own. And I don't know if other people have reviewed this book and made the same conclusion that, you know, 
Alice is the creator of the second section. It seems obvious to me, but some people seem very baffled by this whole two dual narrative and how they hit up against each other without any kind of connection. And I would argue that there is a big connection between those two sections. And I think it's beautifully done. I want to own this book and read it again someday. And I can't wait to see what else Lisa Halliday writes. I think she's incredibly talented and I wish more people would experience this novel for themselves. So I've talked a long time about this and I don't know if I've captured all of the nuances that I wanted to, but thank you for watching to the end of the video and thank you for supporting my channel and I look forward to talking to you more soon. I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.